So, Robin, can you give us a description of how you got into the field of addiction science and the kinds of work and places that you've worked over the years? Right. Well, it was an accident that I got into the field, a uh, uh, happy accident. Um, I'd been a graduate, uh, undergraduate and then a graduate student for a while in English literature and then switched into sociology. Um, had taken uh, what in those days was considered uh, the heart of sociology, which was survey research for a whole year. Um, that was going to turn sociology into a science, they thought. And um, on the basis of that, I got a summer job at what was called the California Drinking Practices Study, which was uh, a study of um, drinking in the general population with survey research. That had been brought, I found out much later, this was um, uh, in um, 1963, and I found out much later that that had come from the fact that a bunch of sociologists had gotten together in um, the late 50s and had uh, recommended to the National Institute of Mental Health in the U.S., which at that point was in charge of alcohol, that uh, uh, we knew a lot, a lot about people who were um, uh, in treatment for alcoholism or and something about Alcoholics Anonymous, but we didn't know anything about alcohol in the general population, drinking patterns and problems in the general population. So that was um, uh, what I stumbled into. Um, it worked, uh, I found it very interesting. The good thing about alcohol from the point of view of a researcher is that it gets into, and a sociological researcher, is it gets into so many different parts of life. Um, tourism, family, uh, you uh, social class, you name the topic, and there's an alcohol and uh, piece to it. So that um, while we didn't have a great deal of prestige, um, and you know, alcohol in the sociology department was, in those days was a matter of uh, a week about um, Skid Row and uh, uh, drunks on Skid Row, essentially, in one course, and that was about all you could point to. Um, it was, uh, we could move around between topics because we didn't have uh, great prestige without people feeling like we were trespassing on their territory. Right. So during that time when you got engaged in survey research, you also somehow got hooked up with an international project that was sponsored by the World Health Organization. Yeah. We'd been working for, by that time I'd been working for several years in, uh, we'd switched uh, or expanded from only being concerned with drinking patterns to, all, to being concerned also with problems from drinking and also to longitudinal studies where you followed people over time. Um, and uh, basically, uh, uh, the World Health Organization was uh, beginning to take alcohol seriously. Actually, uh, it was um, money from NIAAA, from the Americans, that um, made it possible for them to do a study. Um, which was of community response to alcohol problems, um, which was a quite pioneering study that involved um, general population survey as well as uh, um, uh, some clinical samples, essentially. In what yeah. countries was that done in? That was done in Mexico and Zambia and uh, Scotland. Um, we also did an equivalent in California, so okay. that was four countries in the end. And was it after that that you got involved with the Purple Book? Uh, y y yes, essentially. Um, and that was alcohol policy, uh, alcohol policy and public health? Yeah, well, alcohol, alcohol control, control policy. policy and public health perspective yeah. was the full name of it. Basically, if you look at the authors of that book, it's a bunch of sociologists. Um, Griffith Edwards, I think, was the only exception who was actually a medical person. Um, and uh, we were, but we decided quite deliberately to fly the flag of public health, essentially, because uh, of the perspective that that had on alcohol problems, that it was on the population as a whole, that it included um, measures, uh, uh, policy measures that were aimed at the policy, at the, at the uh, sorry, policy measures that were aimed at the uh, whole drinking population. Um, and um, also, you can find in the book that we were also, as sociologists, were quite concerned about the labeling and uh, singling out often the stigmatization of people who, um, if you go at it where you 
attack alcohol problems the way they were being attacked in the U.S. and other places at that point, which was, okay, well, we've got to provide treatment for them, essentially. And uh, <clears throat> so we were looking for what, what was there as an alternative uh, additional to treatment that would bring down rates of alcohol problems without segregating out large parts of the population and so, so, um, bringing on what sociologists call secondary deviance, that they then formed groups that, uh, around the uh, clinic and so forth that um, uh, came to think of themselves as different from the general population. And what was the major take-home message of the <coughs> Purple Book? Um, it's there in italics at the beginning and at the end that, uh, um, that uh, uh, the drinking of the whole population affects how many alcohol problems there are, that governments can take action that will affect the level of drinking in a whole population, and the governments ought to pay attention to and this. And what actions came out to be the most influential at that time? Well, uh, in terms of what we were talking about in the book, there was a limited literature that we could draw on. We could certainly point to the fact that there had been big changes in populations uh, in both directions at one time or another. Um, we could point to um, that uh, there were effects from taxation and price, essentially, and we, there was the beginning of a literature about uh, alcohol availability. Um, also, the, the Purple Book, many of the folk involved in the Purple Book were from Canada or Finland. and. Both of those countries had a tradition of um, a state monopoly of uh, um, the uh, off sales of alcohol. And uh, there was the beginnings of uh, recognition that that actually made a difference, essentially, potentially. But the state monopolies usually accomplished their uh, minimization of harm through controls on availability and price. Yeah, I mean, if you look at that time, they actually, it wasn't more expensive um, usually in the, um, in the monopoly states, for instance, in the U.S. than it was in the private um, licensing states. Uh, it's a much more efficient way of, uh, of uh, um, d distributing the alcohol. One of the great surprises when there's been privatization of monopolies in the U.S., everyone thinks, oh, private will be cheaper, and the price and invariably has gone up because the state has insisted that it will get the same revenue. Right. And so it wasn't priced so much. It's more that if you've got a single distribution mechanism, you don't need a huge network. Uh, you don't need another um, liquor store down the street and another one there competing with it, essentially. So that the, the number of places that were selling was smaller. The hours of sale were smaller, which made it cheaper to do also. And you also had state employees uh, um, who, had, uh, who were paid a decent wage and uh, you know, were members of a union and so forth, and uh, who would, in fact, enforce the uh, rules that were there about you, know, you don't sell to people who are underage and so forth. So that book was published in 1975? That's right. And in 1994, Griffith Edwards uh, did a reprise where uh, yeah. he published Alcohol Policy... Uh, and the Public Good, yeah. And the Public Good. Yeah. Uh, a few years later, in 2003, uh, there was a revision of that called Alcohol No Ordinary Commodity, right. and then in 2010, a second edition. Yeah. No, so also, you were yeah. probably the only author who was involved in all four, except, I guess, with Griffith. Yeah, Essa Osterbury, I think, also. Essa, but okay. Yeah. But and the other thing is that there was actually another book also, which Griffith had... And um, the Developing Society yeah, called, and, and, and Policy in Developing Societies, which um, Griffith had um, tried to get WHO to do, and um, um, eventually, you know, I was appointed to do it, essentially. Um, and, you know, a group of ten, uh, ten of us, you know, another... It was very much on the model of alcohol um, policy and the public good, and but... Uh, in the context of low and middle income countries, it had to take quite a different strategy because we didn't have a, um, you know, quantitative literature review. We had to work with essentially um, case studies. So, across that um, period, the literature has improved, but <coughs> have the conclusions changed very much about what kinds of control policies might be useful instruments for public health? I think not very much. Um, uh, along the way, um, 
there's a separate literature on drink driving, which um, became uh, you know clearer about what would work in terms of lowering rates of drink driving. Um, uh, there's certainly been a development that you've had a lot to do with around um, um, brief interventions and so forth. But the list of um, uh, recommended strategies essentially hasn't expanded very much um, uh, other than that from the original availability and price, essentially. Um, I would add that, you know, I'm, um, there are limits to what any of these particular strategies do. Um, and uh, they're affected by what is happening in the culture and in the society and in the, the world, for that matter, at that time. Um, it's not enough, I think, for um, us to deal with alcohol by simply applying three strategies, essentially. We've got to also watch uh, the public discourse about alcohol and what its place is in our lives. and. Um, um, remember that some of the really big changes in history happened n from the ground up, essentially, not from governments imposing uh, restrictions. Right. So another area that you've worked on, particularly at the international level, um, is collaborative projects with groups in many different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, the Genesis Project, more recently, Harm to Others. Mm -hmm. uh, could you describe not only how those projects get started and why they seem to be um, so engaging mm -hmm. to get people involved in mm -hmm. different countries, but what have they produced that makes them uh, as valuable or more valuable than individual studies in a single country? Well, it turns out um, that um, things that work in a particular culture may not work so well in another culture. Um, and understanding that is uh, you're really going to have to do cross-cultural studies to do it. Um, um, and um, those projects take several different forms and they look rather different, um, um, partly in terms of how they're financed. If there's a central financing, then there is a sort of expectation that there will be a common frame that people will uh, follow some minimum um, um, standards for what is done in the project with adaptations to the local society, but you know, checking those adaptations against the um, collective um, um, and, and the directors of the project overall. Um, there's another style of projects that you can see where uh, countries come together uh, who have self-financed uh, groups of uh, uh, researchers in different countries and uh, do something collaboratively. That's quite common, for instance, in the Nordic countries, which have a tradition of that kind of work. Um, um, but you can see it in other places as well. There, the studies are often, um, they help each other in terms of the uh, pushing forward the thinking and the general framing and so forth, but the studies are often not terribly comparable between one, one place and another. Um, I think both kinds of studies have a place in the field um, and can produce really excellent work, but you've got to recognize that um, where the funding is coming from tends to make a difference in how, yeah. the, how it's organized. For the Harm to Others project, why do you think that project is so important now? Well, uh, fundamentally, alcohol is um, arguably the most destructive drug inherently. I'm not talking now about how many people use it, but about its in, in the inherent um, problems from the drug. And a lot of those problems are not happening to the um, drinker. They're um, happening to people around the drinker. That's, for instance, more common for alcohol. More of the harm for, uh, is to others from alcohol as a proportion of all the harm than is true for tobacco, where we've made this big discovery in the last 20 years that, oh yes, secondhand smoking is important. Um, the whole alcohol field in the period since uh, the 1950s and maybe arguably a bit before then emphasized essentially there's the alcoholic, we get the alcoholic into treatment, uh, um, and that is the solution to the problem. And very little attention to what's happening around the drinker. Um, there's some exceptions to that, uh, Jim Orford and others in Britain, um, some other work that you can point to. But uh, fundamentally, 
the emphasis has been pretty single-mindedly on, on the drinker. And um, I think from the point of view of um, interesting research, from the point of view of uh, um, wanting to understand alcohol problems better, there's a good reason to be looking at uh, alcohol's harm to others. It's also important for policy because it um, essentially, uh, no matter what your position is on how much, uh, how active government should be, uh, there's general agreement that if you if my something I do is harming someone else, then that's something for the government to be worrying about. It does make it a bit problematic, actually, that alcohol's problems are so widely spread. They're not so much only a matter of health. They're also a matter of um, uh, well, obviously, there's violence which involves health, but it's also uh, other as aspects of it as well. Um, and a lot of social problems that are associated with drinking. And that means it's not clearly under the jurisdiction of the doctors or the ministers of health or the, you know, the, the health system. That's what makes it so much more complicated than tobacco, where really what you worry about is essentially the health of the secondhand smokers. Um, and uh, we, it becomes very politicized. I mean, we, uh, big um, political arguments happen about, well, what do you do about these things get, get defined as crimes? Or, uh, so it's much more difficult to deal with in some ways. So maybe the analogy with tobacco and secondhand smoke, which tip the scales in favor of a framework convention mm. of recommending certain policies around the world, maybe that's not going to work for alcohol, even though you may be able to generate equally compelling data about the second yeah, effects I mean, of alcohol. Yeah, it's a good issue to think about. I mean, that um, you can generate the evidence you write, but the nature of the argument is going to be less an argument within the sphere of health. So, uh, shifting gears a little bit, during your career, you've uh, worked uh, in California, yeah. in Berkeley, at a research center. You directed the research center there. Well, I started out as the most junior research you assistant, but eventually... You research assistant. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, at one point, uh, moved to Canada yeah. and directed the Addiction Research Foundation and then the, uh, the Center for uh, Addiction and Mental Health. Well, yes, in a way. I, I was the research um, uh, vice president. Uh, okay. the, the Addiction Research Foundation was a very large organization. It was a very large organization that included treatment, included um, community um, offices um, that were advising on prevention and so forth, um, as well as research. But I was the vice president for research. Um, I, when it um, became part of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which was under the direction of psychiatrists, uh, the notion that a sociologist would head the, head the research uh, department didn't, didn't fit their view right. of the world, so I moved on again. <laughs> and you moved to Norway yep. and then to Sweden, right? and now you're back where you started in, in Australia. Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what can you say to young people who were getting started in a career in addiction science in terms of the rewards, the opportunities? and the things that they need to do, like uh, get started in an environment uh, that's going to nurture their interest in doing research, yeah. and as a research center, the, the best environment to work in. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind this advice is from someone who's now 77, and that um, things have changed as generations go along, but I think some of the advice is still worth listening to. Alcohol and drugs, um, are n peripheral to every discipline and every profession. You know, you cannot point to um, maybe narcologists in the former Soviet Union, but it's hard to point to a profession that is centered on them, essentially. Um, and uh, for that matter, in terms of the agencies, uh, the, we ended up with an alcohol and drug uh, specific treatment system in many countries, um, essentially because the other agencies weren't, were, didn't want to deal with it or weren't effectively dealing with it. They would take the name on, but they wouldn't do much about it. 
So this is a field which is um, from the traditional, in the traditional academic sense, um, a, a rather peripheral field. Um, and um, that means, um, first of all, you know, you've got to be good, you know, if you're going to survive in the academic world um, and pay it. But it also means that um, you've got to look for opportunities. And in particular, you know, I think you will greatly benefit if you can find some kind of network of folk um, which you can relate to and uh, exchange with and so forth that will um, help nourish your thinking and, uh, and, and push you forward. And um, that's what a research center does. And that at the local level, that's what a research center does. There are also um, um, uh, uh, things on the web that you can join, uh, uh, listservs and so forth. Uh, for alcohol, there's the Kettle Brewing Society for um, Social uh, and Epidemiological Research on Alcohol, which is an international uh, group that meets uh, annually and also has thematic meetings. For drugs, there's the International Society for um, um, uh, Study of Drug Policy. Um, and um, I, I, I would encourage people, you know, I think that the thing to do is in this is, on the one hand, keep some kind of connection with whatever your academic um, the basis in terms of your training, if you're getting training in uh, whether it's in um, public health or in uh, epidemiology or whether in sociology or whatever, but um, also build those connections with people who are working specifically in the field. Okay, well, thanks very much, Robin, and I have to get to the airport. <laughs> okay.